Welcome back to another episode of The Loco Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Conlon, and today I'm joined by my friend, Tommy Vext, who is a singer, yeah. musician. <clears throat> Resident weirdo. Resident weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> Team weirdos. You guys should have just heard what we were just talking about. What? You had an excellent Jordan Peterson. It's not that good. Oh, it's not that good. <laughs> it's terrible. It's literally the worst Man, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> doing impressions is necessary. Especially for men. <laughs> he sounds I mean, darn, darn it. He sounds nothing, nothing like, like Jordan Peterson. In my head, that's, you know, in the committee in my head when I'm like trying to make decisions. I'm like, no, no, listen, listen here, buckle. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sick. Okay, so resident weirdo. Jordan Tommy. Peterson's in my head. Like, you know. There's so many different voices in my head. Oh my god, me too. Just reassigning my personality types to uh, to like, like yeah, you know, other. What are we gonna voices. do today? Who are we gonna be? Yeah, Kermit the Frog comes out. Yeah, maybe that's why I like him because he's so so. You know, how will you guys? Okay, so we're not gonna talk about impersonations today. <laughs> maybe we will, but we are going to talk a lot about your like mental health struggles and how fitness has helped with that and i think that that's sure. going to be really impactful for a lot of people so first give a little background you are a singer musician artist yeah, yeah. Uh, and resident weirdo but give a better intro than that my professional resume would say that i am a multi-platinum selling uh international uh recording artist okay uh solid yeah I got a couple of number one songs <laughs> at radio uh i just i went solo in 2021 uh, left my band um, after a very successful couple of years dominating the charts. Now I'm dominating the Billboard charts, which is um, pro- I'm probably the highest selling independent rock artist uh, in in the United States of America. Hell so th- yeah. that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, and um, I would say so. I, yeah, and I'm about to leave on a U.S. tour. I'm dropping my first album uh, as a, uh, since I left my band. So I'm putting out a solo album and. That's what I do. I'm also 13 years sober uh, before my music career took off. I've been a musician since I was 14 years old, so and I've been signed to record labels on and off since I was 18. Um, but I had a, a, a serious dance with drugs and alcohol, and I wound up getting sober at 27. In my early 30s, I became a drug and alcohol counselor, and then I ran a sober living in Santa Monica. Then I became a sober coach where I was a live-in um, sober mentor for the Hollywood elite, athletes, pop stars, actors, crazy stuff, crazy, crazy stories. Yeah. Um, right. And I'm, my book is coming out next year, my biography, which was co-wrote by Riley Perez, who's a writer at HBO and nice. Showtime. And so for many this? other shows you guys probably watch. Probably watch. <laughs> you know, what? these are my humble brags. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. just casual flex. What is a, so like a sober coach, you like live with these people? Yeah, so so sober coaching is is a pretty intensive thirty to ninety day gig, right? And so, you know, a lot of people who are very famous or very wealthy, it would be extremely disruptive for them to be in a rehab facility yeah. because of paparazzi or because the other people in there wouldn't behave right, or um, you know, it's a, it's a, the anonymity aspect is is highly highly important especially if you're trying to help someone before they get in the tabloids for the train wreck they've become. So someone like myself, and, or, you know, there are other people that do this. Uh, I worked for a corporation first before I opened my own um, sober companion company. And we live with you and shadow you and make sure you don't buck up. Yeah, um, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's I just, like... I, I never really thought of it that way until you said it. Yeah, it's relapse prevention. A lot and, more sense than going to rehab. Yeah, and then we identify trigger points. You know, like I've traveled with artists, with other artists who, you know, we discuss when they're... what At what point in the day are they triggered to drink and use? And I, you know, it's a, it's a very important time to replace that with either uh, a group therapy or, count, or one-on-one counseling or... Just replacement therapy. So there's a lot of, that's like the very small kind of what I what I did. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm just, of course, that's like where my brain, I'm just like curious now and I'm having all these questions. But that actually makes a lot more sense because mm. going to rehab is, it's kind of like any behavior change, right? When you take yourself out of an environment, you're going to be acting 
maybe differently than if you were at home, right? Because at home, mm-hmm. around all your normal things, like that's when you're probably going to be a lot more triggered. Correct. And then if you're in an industry where everyone is enabling you, mm-hmm. and, or if you're an actor and you're on set, or if you're an athlete and you're in the off season, everyone wants to party, or if you're an artist and people are bringing you free drugs, these are a little bit more specific uh, issues that most people don't have when they leave rehab. Most people get out of rehab and go back to the office mm-hmm. and their families and whatnot and the entertainment industry. People who industry. are supportive. Yeah, and the entertainment industry. Um, you know, and it's I've seen managers who sabotage their their artists who they want to keep them high because they don't want them to look at the books. Oh they don't God. want them to start seeing how all the money's being stolen. Yeah, it's a very, you know, it's a, I mean, LA is gross. It's, that's it's, so horrible. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the thing. It's like, they want you to be sober enough to get on stage and do your thing, but they don't want you to be too sober that you're starting to be aware of everything. You know what I mean? Damn. Yeah. There's some, I mean, I don't know anything about this life. So how did, I guess, go back to your I guess journey like when you started is that when you started to have your struggles with that or was this like way earlier on in life no no my story begins with my my birth mother you know I was adopted Um, I have a twin brother and my birth mother was a crackhead and she used while she was pregnant and we were born um, in in Brooklyn and Greenpoint Hospital which isn't there anymore and my mom left us and so we went into the system, and then my adopted parents took both of us. Uh, and we were, you know, two mixed-race kids in 1982, and my parents took us in. And my father at the time was sober. Um, he was a Vietnam vet. You know, we, I, we had, I came from very humble beginnings. And we had a lot of normalcy in, in my early childhood. Uh, you know, and then my parents adopted my sister. And, but my father and my mother's relationship started to strain. My brother had severe mental health issues. And started to be institutionalized around 11 years old for extreme violent behavior, like kind of really disturbing stuff, like hurting animals, setting fires. Oh. Yeah, like he, like he, all my, the telltale signs. Yeah, he's currently incarcerated right now. Um, he's he's currently serving a 20 year sentence for attempted murder. Um, but to give you the idea of like how our paths in life, even though we both came from the same situation, it's about choices. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so. You know, I think by the time I was 13 or 14, the family dynamic had deteriorated and I found myself, you know, like in the experimental stage of like stealing beers and booze from my friend's parents and smoking weed. And I joined a band like, you know, I got into heavy metal. You know, everybody was into rap. I liked rap music, too, but I was angry because my life, you know what I mean? And I had a lot of resentments about I probably didn't I wasn't sophisticated enough to understand um, the complexity of the emotional uh, complications of my origin story, right? And what, what not having grown up with my real family and also, you know, being being black and having not look like my white parents, you know, stuff like that. So all those issues and I was angry and I found a microphone and uh, I found that I could sing. So, you know, for, since I was 14 years old, I pretty much, you know, have been in a band. And I started drinking and partying. And then, 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 like, things escalated to other drugs. And I had a pretty Was your family involved at that point, or did they not really know? No, we were kind of on our own. I mean, and things were different then, too. This is, you're talking about, like, 1995, 96, where, you know, my parents had their own problems going on. And yeah, that's what I mean. Like, they yeah, were, yeah, we in were their own I, shit. Yeah, and I, I mean, I had a job. I was working as a deli boy, and, you know, that's, I was just doing my own thing, saving up for concert tickets and you know, scamming, you know, <laughs> I like so much, you know, but yeah. So like, oh, I, I basically sketchy shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, you know, my, I, my, my, my adolescence can kind of progress into being a teen. And then in my early twenties, I, I was selling drugs. My brother was a drug dealer. My brother kind of, he's, he's bigger than me. He's way tougher than me and way scarier than me. And he kind of made a name for himself in the neighborhood. And he was doing his thing with, with some pretty heavy dudes. And um, I thought I was a tough guy. And then when I was 21, I almost got killed by a gang. Uh, I was drunk. I got into a fight with this guy and his friends came back and then jumped me and my buddy. They ran me over with a car and then they beat me and my friend up with baseball bats. So we almost till we were dead and like a car pulled up 
in front of the library and like, hey, get out of here. Like, so that was a wake up call for me. Like, I remember, you know, and I was living in my dad's basement and I had no heat and no air conditioning. And I had like a rusty weight bench that somebody I've picked out of the garbage. I mean, we were really poor. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I couldn't walk. I had to have my dad and my brother carry me to take a piss every time I had to go to the bathroom. And it was so like incomprehensibly demoralizing. I got the MO, like I got the message. I'm like, this is not the life for me, and I'm not. I don't want to do this anymore. And I, you know, I pursued music, right? So I was like, I'm gonna be. This is what I'm doing. And so I got really serious. So by the time I was 22, the band that I had, I've been with the same band since I was 14. And I was like 22, 23. They weren't taking it seriously. People were getting, re- you know, they were getting city jobs and, you know, somebody got a girl pregnant and they're all, you know, whatever, all that shit. And uh, I was like, I'm doing this, you know. And um, I auditioned for a band in California and it was a band that already was like signed. I had used to listen to their music and they had a new project. So I like, I broke into it. this. The funny story is, this is self will, right? The self will of the alcoholic addict, um, and also too, like I, I should mention that I was obese too. Like I had a food addiction, so I my weight fluctuated from two hundred twenty pounds to three hundred twenty pounds on and off during this period of time because of you know the de- I always had depression. My first suicidal thoughts started when I was about eight years old. Like something I've been dealing with forever. And so food was the first coping mechanism, and then it became drugs, and then it was living in a certain lifestyle. And the only time I ever felt comfortable in my skin was when I was on stage. So that that being comfortable in that is what drove me like to go so far just to be able to be a performer. And so I wound up, you know, uh, I worked security. I, after I stopped selling drugs, I got a job as a bouncer and security guard. And I, work, I went to this club that I used to work at, and the... These, there was like a, a record label was having a 25th anniversary. And so all these celebrities were rehearsing at the club I, I used to work for. So I wore my security shirt, my old security shirt, and broke into the rehearsals and started singing the songs with the bands. Oh, shit. And then I, that's how I got the job. So two months later, I got Damn. flown to California and I moved in, into a trap house with this guitar player guy who I didn't <laughs> even know. And that was the beginning of that. It's notable because when, you know, I still didn't make the direct correlation that the drinking and the drugs and, and you know, alcoholism and addiction was my issue. I still believed that it was because I was from Brooklyn or it was because my mom left me or it was because my dad uh, drank and my adopted mother abandoned me and my brother was crazy and blah, 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 you know, poor me, poor me, poor me a drink. And so I went to LA and <laughs> wherever you go, there you are. And, you know, I, I, I signed a record deal, toured all over the world, made a pretty cool metal album. It was very renowned, you know. Um, and then, you know, I, kept just doing I kept partying me and the guitar player the band did not get along he tried to fight me I beat the shit out of him on stage then we broke up (laughs) I joined another band um then this punk rock band started but during Uh, this time like would you say that you I was a a cokehead yeah was it getting worse was it oh god it was horrible I was I I mean I remember going on I joined this next band and I was like yeah I'm gonna be sober and because they had one so guy you in the had band the intention who was sober. that you wanted to be, though. Yeah, like, yeah, but I couldn't. It was a problem. I couldn't fucking stand myself. Yeah, I couldn't look in the fucking mirror. I hated myself. Right? Why would I do anything good for me? You know what I mean? And so I, rem- I, I got to the point on tour. So the next band I went on tour with, they were literally one of the posters on my wall, and the singer died in a car accident ten years before. I was a huge fan of this band, Snot. And they hired me to do their 10-year anniversary tour of his death. So we did a big tribute to him, and I crushed it, but I was miserable, absolutely miserable. I I was, you know, the first two days of tour, I'm like, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to go to the gym. No. Three days in, I'm like walking off stage, and I I won't drink before I go on stage. That was the one thing. I didn't drink and do drugs before I go on stage. However... As soon as you got off. As soon as I got off, I was like, boom, you know. See, I figured you would have probably done that before to, like, get in that zone. But you said, like, No, was... because once I start, I can't stop. So I, oh, if I ruin yeah. the show, they won't give me drinks. Mm, you see what I'm saying? True. So I, all I have so to do is. So you wouldn't operate well? No. No? No, no. 
no. Okay. I need to be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like I'm a wrecking ball. Well, I feel like that's part uh, of yeah. some people's problem is that they do operate well, right? Like when they are under the influence. No, this to some when degree. I, so when I was like 20, I did a show wasted and I got naked on stage. And like <laughs> I was like, I'll never get. I, I was like, all right, memo, I got you. So that's why I wouldn't. I would never do that. Like I tried it. Not a good. Not a good idea. <laughs> You know, my girlfriend at the me. time, you know, not happy about this. <laughs> I definitely got my ass beat. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. Don't remember why. And, uh, yeah, like, so anyway, long story short, uh, you know, I was, like, getting off stage, drinking Jack Daniels to the point of blacking out. And then I would have to find cocaine to, like, balance it out. So then I would do coke. So now I'm drunk and high. But I'm too high. I can't go to sleep. So I got to take pills to go to sleep. And then in the, when I wake up, it's like, you know, three or four o'clock, five o'clock the next day. And I got two hours before I got to be on stage because I was opening up for a tour. You know, then I'm on stage and I'm like, oh, oh, everybody jump, everybody down, everybody left and right and here. And, oh. Like I was literally like Richard Simmons on crack on stage. And they're like, man, this guy. So much energy. He's just, he's the truth. And I'm like, I am a fucking crackhead freak. And we're going <laughs> to fucking have a good time, everybody. Like, well, you know. And dude, it was good because the shows, people were like, yo. Like, guy's I was wild. coming out early and like, I'm like, ah, you know. <laughs> it's like a fucking, <laughs> like just riding the snake. Like, you ever see Jim Carrey talk? Like, <laughs> he's like, do methamphetamine and run. And he's like, ride the snake. Like, that was me. <laughs> it's just like, fucking go, boys. And then I just crashed, like, you know, and then it just, it wasn't working, you know, it just wasn't working. Yeah, and, you can and, only do that for so long. Yeah. Before and I, you either, like, lose your mind completely, yeah, or you the, do some stupid shit. Well, the tour <laughs> ended, and I, I yeah. like, I was like, I have nothing to live for, I want to kill myself. Like, um, I wonder why. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. I realized all this stuff about myself, right? So, was this really the first time that you probably were yeah, reflective yeah. enough on that? Yeah, I just was, I, I mean, I just remember, the like... The my last night of drinking and drugging, it wasn't some glamorous thing. It was like I lost, I like shit and pissed and threw up on the floor of my friend's bathroom, who was like my normal friend who didn't do drugs. And I was so embarrassed and I had to clean everything up. And like, I just remember being like, you know, I had the foxhole prayer. I was like, God, I can't do this anymore. And I heard a voice said, you don't have to. And I was like, I was like, am I high? Am I still high? Am I still high? Am I, is that you? Maybe. He's like, call Sonny. I was like, so I called the dude. And I'm like, hey, man, you got to come get me. I'm a crackhead. Like, again. We all know. Everyone knows. <laughs> know. Everyone knows. It's like. Everyone knows besides you, apparently. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> And then I began my, my journey in sobriety. and Damn. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that you learn. And 12 step programs, I think every person should take the 12 steps, right? And if you, if you take the 12 steps and remove alcohol, you can put anything in there mm -hmm. that, that you're powerless over, right? Some people are workaholics, right? Like, so, you know, I'm powerless over my workaholic, my workaholism and my life has become unmanageable, right? Or I'm powerless over relationships. I powerless over my partner's behavior and my life has become unmanageable. That's the start. Right. So for me, it was drugs and alcohol then. And almost every couple of years of my recovery, I have to, you know, because I'm I'm kind of like a fucking jungle book. Right. I was like raised by the fucking streets like there was nobody like I'm literally a fucking animal. It's a it's a miracle that I, you know, pay my taxes on time and have a car and you know, have, you know, my credit's cool. And I'm like, oh, all these like. You know, these are things I was like, oh, these are white people things, right? Like, <laughs> dude, this is really serious, but that's the fuck, the fucked up part is like, dude, where I come from, shit is so fucked up. Like, but this, even all the poor people are kind of the same, right? Everyone's like, we don't know how this shit works. Nobody's teaching anybody how this shit works. And so I had to learn. So I was like, you know, I had to become accountable. Part of the 12 steps is you have to make an inventory of all the things that have gone wrong. Right, all the people who harmed you, your perception of that, and then you have to look at your own part and then share it with another person. Yeah, that's the. I think that's probably the really powerful part of it. Like I've heard about, you know, people yeah, just yeah. Um, just going to those meetings and just the fact that you have to, you know, talk and like put yourself out there. Like that is so yeah. hard, but that really keeps you accountable. Um, so those twelve steps, though, like I know that they have like 
I'm not sure what the name, like obviously alcohol, alcoholics. Al- yeah, there's, there's AA, there's AA, NA, but there's, which is Narcotics Anonymous. Yeah, and there's the there's food. There's OA, which yeah. is Overeaters Anonymous, which is a little bit different. I was going to say, are those all the same 12 steps or like roughly? The principles are basically similar, but there are different parameters because X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Because you can't be absent. Like I personally think that f- like food addiction is the hardest because if I don't smoke crack, everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> But if I don't eat food, I'm going to die. Yeah. So, so you see what I'm yeah. saying? Abstinence is not, um, you can't be abstinent from eating. You know, yeah. it's a life function. And so it's really difficult. I gained 30 pounds my first 30 days of sobriety. I was but say, I, I had w- no money and I was homeless. But I was eating pints of ice cream yeah, for $2. Yeah. Like that's where say, I was getting my calories. At what point were, like, at what point were you in your fitness journey? At the worst, because you said you had fluctuated a lot, like two twenty to three twenty, and then um, so at like kind of I the was peak. A, of... I was. A th- I got out of being super fat, uh, like when I was doing when I moved to California, like a little before that, because I was so ashamed. Mm-hmm. So the shame of seeing me on stage at mm-hmm. that weight and stuff, and the shame of like. You know, and I also I had a super hot girlfriend. I don't know why the fuck she was with me. I was like a fat fuck. And uh, we're still friends to this day, and she's married with kids and has moved to Europe and has a wonderful husband and, and a, like, a six-year-old son. And so I'm like, you realize how fucking much of a mess I was? And she's like, no, I just loved you. You know, I was like, they don't make them like this anymore, ladies and gentlemen. You know what I mean? Like, it was like, a, what was the movie, the TV show with uh, the fat guy and he had the, the hot wife? He was like work for UPS. It's like the most bullshit. Like n- this would never happen. Um, you know what I mean? Oh my King God. of Queens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was like that was. King of except I was fat and working construction. <laughs> I was just like, this is bizarre. You're like, why? But yeah, I mean, she saw the good in you. Yeah but, yeah. but that's interesting though because so you lost weight or you know made some changes because of shame, but that wasn't enough either you know what i mean like well, and that's no, something that we talk it wasn't enough to beat the drugs like yeah. look this is the thing shame there's healthy shame and toxic shame mm-hmm. right so there's the toxic kind of shame like you're not i'm not good enough right <sighs> i'm not doing enough i'm not this uh, uh, right because toxic shame is when you place yourself in a uh, in a position to judge yourself for not being omnipotent there's no way you can do everything and be everything all at once. So by placing those expectations on yourself, you're setting yourself up for failure. Healthy shame is when you're behaving in a manner that is making you unhealthy, embarrassing yourself, hurting your family members, hurting your future, and saying, I need to make a change. Yeah, that's healthy shame. So when people are like, oh, don't fat shame, as a former obese person, Fat shaming is essential to saving your life. My Aunt Tina died of morbid obesity, right? She was a wonderful woman. She was a nurse. And she adopted three children that were, had, were, came from hell and gave them a life. And she didn't get to watch them grow up because she couldn't stop eating. And my mom, I, you know, I come from an obese family. My mom, after my aunt died... She was the first inspiration. She lost 100 pounds. She was like, I'm not doing it. My mom's 5'2". She was 200 pounds. And she just, one day, she said she would walk one mile to the park and walk around it as many times as she could, rain, sleet, or snow. Like, there was no stopping this woman, you know? And so that was my weight loss journey. was like, I'm like, my mom can't do anything. If she can do this, then I can do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... You know, because I'm like, my mom's a little lady. She's not like, you know, big, you know, she's not, you know, she is tough. But the perception is like, well, you know, and that's the domino effect is that it was more impactful, not that my aunt died. It was more impactful that my mom changed. And so when people were like, oh, you shouldn't fat shame. We should accept all bodies. This is the other. It's a it's a healthy thing. Right. Like if my if my best friend has asthma and is smoking. I'm like, bro, don't smoke around me. That's a boundary for me. And you're like, oh, I'm fucking. I'm like, no, I'm not going to tolerate this. Like, I actually just had this conversation. There was there was somebody I was I was talking to like romantically. I was interested in, and we were friends for a long time. But she's got a drinking problem, and, I, and like, 
I know this. And so time had passed and she was like, no, like I don't drink anymore. This at the other. And you know, the, the more you're around somebody, you see it. And I'm like, listen, like it's okay to drink if you're normal, but you definitely drink like I used to drink and you disappear for a whole weekend and then end up in the hospital. And like, you are not, you, first of all, you're not being honest with me. And no matter how much I care about you, I have to set a boundary. Like, you know, I have to file people off because you're not going where I'm going. Like, this is where I'm going. And if I care about you, you're, the train doors are open for the people that I want. That, or, or that are, if you want to get on, let's go. But I'm going this way. If you don't want to get on and you want to sit here and wallow in this shit, that's on you. You know what I mean? And so, you know, sometimes people, when you really love people, you should tell them the truth about themselves so they don't die. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and there's different levels to everything, right? Like, obviously, there's a lot of people who drink alcohol who don't have a problem with it. Yeah, yeah. There's but, a lot of people who eat sugar and have snacks once in a while. And they're like, yeah. oh. they're like you know, I'll always see somebody, like, you, you ever go on a date and somebody has a piece of dessert and you're like, <laughs> how did you do this? <laughs> what the? <laughs> you know, and like we have a lot of friends who compete in, in mm-hmm. you know, do the most extreme sport, like bodybuilding. Yeah, and know. I'm like, I don't know how you do Many don't. years. Yeah. Many years. I'm it's, just like, how do they do this? It's just like I anything. Would change. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm literally like, oh, Schmiegel want cake. <laughs> you know, people are like, what's wrong with Tommy? I'm like, <laughs> it's prep week. I just need it. I should have Milky Way <laughs> bar. You know what I mean? Like, a fucking freak. So I don't even put people, like, I know myself. I'm like, I'm not even putting the people around me through that guy. You know what I mean? Through hungry, vexed. Like, oh, no. <laughs> it, it is a whole, like, and when you're not in that place, it's super easy to be like, oh, of course I wouldn't act like that. You know what I mean? But then I think back to all those, those yeah. times where it's like, when you're that, like, hungry, yeah. it is a totally different feeling. Because it's not just like, oh, I didn't eat lunch, right? Like, it's like, I've dieted well, for nine months to 10% body fat. If I don't have this meal, I literally feel incapable of functioning. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's like being, awful. it's like getting off drugs. Being it's, on prep is like detoxing. <laughs> like, because your body is like, I need the thing. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, we can't have it. Yeah, and like you said, it's like we food is... We can't have it, we have something to do. Like, food is everywhere, you know yeah. what I mean? And you have to, but, you know, that's oh, part yeah. of what you sign up for. Like, when you do a bodybuilding show, you know what you're getting into. And it's something that we obviously coach a lot of our clients to. Like, listen, like, especially with hunger. I'm like, hunger is a part of this. Like, mm-hmm. if you are not prepared to be hungry, this is probably not the sport for you. Um, and it's just, one. Like, honestly, just accepting that makes Dude, it a lot easier. You know who, but, who doesn't eat? Like, it, Andy doesn't eat. During the day, I, I never see him eat. He doesn't eat, but he <laughs> talks a lot about about if you can control your hunger, you can tr- yeah. control everything. And he also used to, you know, he lost a shit ton of weight, yeah. and he used to, he got big, and then and he I think lost it, it all. It depends too. Again, like where, like how you're wired, and like what works for you. You know, we are very big on talking about different. Like, there's different methods for everybody, right? Yeah, for some yeah. people, you know, incorporating. Just, there's just so many different ways to achieve the same result, but you have to know what works for you. Yeah, and I have emergency sandwiches all over the place. <laughs> you're like, what's this? You open my glove box. You're like, what's this? Is that I'm an like, it's, no, it's like I got first form bars melted. First form bars. I was like, in my that glove shit's box. melted as fuck if it's in the car. Dude, I, my worst nightmare is like getting pulled over after the gym and after I've eaten and I'm like being held up. Because I'm always nice to the cops, but when I'm hungry, I'll be a fucking asshole to my grandmother's spirit. Like, you know, I'd be like, whoa, get out of here, grandma. You know, they just like hand you a Snickers. Yeah, just like, oh, calm okay, down. Everything's fine. <laughs> everything's fine now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So Tommy's still very much struggling with his food problems. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. Whatever, listen. This is. A, this Came to the right place. Yeah, yeah, the honest podcast. Um, but so anyway, like, so. Tell me about your struggles. So, yeah, healthy, healthy shame. <laughs> Food, drug addiction, sex addiction is another one. Like, that's a whole other thing. I went through that whole fucking thing. Well, it then, all relies on the same patterns and behaviors, right? And yeah. there are differences. I'm not going to say that like, a cocaine addiction is the same as a sex addiction, the same as a food addiction. Well, but they, they center, do all work they on cent- the dopamine system. They center in the same parts of your yeah. brain. And it's also, it's like redirecting and regrooving. And then, yeah. you know, we're living in a society where, uh, unfortunately, the corporatization of, of, America has allowed, you know, the FDA and there's, there's not really any regulations for corporations in this country to uh, not poison us, right? 
So they're putting stuff in, you know, they're getting kids started, you know, like the shit that's in McDonald's, the stuff, cereal, like the stuff that we feed kids. If you go to Europe, uh, they have to put certain, you know, if there's toxins in our food in the European and Australian countries, they have to label it. So, you know, Nabisco, Johnson & Johnson, whatever, pick, pick any of the big five food food distributors. They won't put the toxic stuff in the food that goes over there. They'll put it in here because we don't have to list it. Because the food companies in America also lobby for the politicians so they control what has to be you know, the regulations. So imagine if I own a corporation. Maybe I say I sell cars, right? And I just buy the government because I'm so I have so much money. And so I'm like, we're not going to do regulations. Uh, if the seatbelts don't work and the airbags don't work, you're not allowed to sue us. And so I I spend a bunch of money because I don't want to pay lawsuits. And so, you know, I have a bill passed in Congress. And now I, I'm completely indemnified from if people die from using my product. You know what I mean? But So they're doing that with food. They're doing that with the medical industry. They're doing that with me- medical, you know, uh, medicines and drugs that they give us. So... You know, this uh, this is like another layer of of self love is understanding like there is healthy shame and toxic shame. Don't destroy yourself because you got to a certain place. Educate yourself and understand why. Right, you're in a system that is designed to make you fail because we have a very. There's probably 1,100 families that run the entire world. There's billions of people on this planet, and part of them control all the food. They want you to be fat. They want you to be lazy. They want you to be complicit. They want you to have low testosterone. They don't want you to build relationships with people, they, especially men. I mean, they've really they've attacked women and demoralized the value of, of, of relationships in our culture in America because men will die for their family. We will, we're naturally hardwired to fight and die for our families. That's why wars are fought. If you don't have something more important than yourself to live for, you won't put your life on the line. If you don't have kids and you don't have a, what, whatever your person is, right? Like whatever kind of relationship you have, there's nothing to fight for. So it's easy to control a population that is, refuses to fight back. So it's, easy to, it's more easy than ever to be obese. We've never had this much access to calories. Yeah, and, you and know what I mean? the lifestyle has completely changed. You know, like most, I would say most people are doing work behind a computer screen or they're doing something that's sure. super sedentary. And unless you are actively going out of your way to move on a daily basis, to exercise, to be healthy, like it is much easier to, to your point, to be unhealthy. And when you think about the traditional like setup of, of you know, nine to five, eight to five, whatever it is, you know, there's not a lot of people who are like, oh, let me go take like a walk break. Let me go outside. Let me go get sunshine. Let me go do this. Mm -hmm. Like those things are not instilled. And when you're sitting behind a screen all day, you are going to feel really tired. And then you're like, well, when I get off work, I'm too tired to go to the gym. And now I don't want to go train. And now I, now I want to just sit on the couch and I'm going to watch TV and then I'm going to like eat shitty food. And it all just compiles really easily. And we all have days obviously where, you know, we're not maybe our best, but you have to set those things those habits in place because if you don't then you're going to look up and be like wait where did the last three months go where the last look three the, years look the last the, 30 years look at the cost of food oh well, yeah right you, you're like oh i could feed my whole family off the dollar menu every day for a year i'm like yeah cool and then they'll never do anything they'll get diabetes they'll get you know what i mean it, it takes time you know what i mean because the human body is resilient why is like why is the produce section of whole food so fucking expensive bro i don't know why is yeah. everything so far? But that's what well, I'm that's saying. That's I'm a whole like, story. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, you know, it, it is. It really is sad though, because, but ultimately like it, there is like a, the short term payoff is, or the short term win really is like this long term. Um, what's the word I'm looking well, it's for? Like, it's like recovery. It's a day at a time. All you, anybody, all you have to do is try to be healthy at day, one day at a time. Mm-hmm. You don't have to look down the line. Like, you know, that's what happened to me. I'm like, I'm just going to do today. And then 13 years goes by. And you're like, oh, I'm free of the bondage of drugs and alcohol. You know what I mean? And How then, much would you say that training consistently like helped that? Uh, do you think that that had a... Well, any you, advantage or yeah of course because i needed like i wasn't getting any dopamine hits and so you know i it's like i was i did cardio queen for for 
probably two years where I was like getting the high from running, you know, because I'm just like, all right. I was like, what like, is cardio queen? Oh, <laughs> uh, cardio queens are people who go to the gym, but their like main focus is to do yeah, cardio. You were referring to yourself as a cardio queen. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, is that like a program? Did I miss this? No, no. <laughs> it's just like, I'm going to just do, I'm going to, you know, yeah. and it's like, I have chronic anxiety. I constantly want to get fucked up. I can't deal with life. I'm like, I'm going to take caffeine and I'm going to run. You know, yeah. and that's what you do. And like, and then after your run, you you feel good, right? You're like, oh, all right. And then, you know, the next day you're like, I want you. It's, I need it again. I gotta go run. <laughs> but your body doesn't look the way you want it to, and you're not yeah. really strong. Yeah. So then it changes, you know. So everything's about finding balance, but it gives you something else to work on. And you know, I would basically run away from my low, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, you know, even even sometimes when I would run outside, I would pretend I was being chased because I'm Just like to I'm get too more tired, of and I'm like, no, boost. if you, you know what I mean, I'm like, if you don't if you don't keep going, you're gonna die. Like everything has to be so dramatic with me. I'm like, oh, we're gonna keep going one more mile. <laughs> you can't just go for a run. And I'm like, you didn't get me. You know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We're gonna stick it to you. Just running away from like giant bags of coke and needles. It's like ah. this sounds like a fever He's, dream. The, yeah, but I'm just like ah. so. Anyway, so I did that, and then you know I didn't like that, and I started lifting weights again, and yeah. So I mean, it, it's very important to replace one thing, and I think going to meetings was the most important thing, right? Like meeting makers make it, and being in a group. You know, recovery is the first place, the, is the real me too. It's been going on for 100 years. Because it's the most powerful thing that somebody can say when you come in there and you're like, I can't fucking do it. I'm fucking, you know, I'm, like, I'm losing my place and I'm like, kicked out of my job. And my person left me and my dog shit on my bed. And someone's like, yeah, me too. I'm like, oh, I went, what? You yeah, know? You're like, whoa. Because we all think we're terminally unique. We think we're terminally unique in, in our struggles financially. We think we're the only ones going through our weight problems. We think we're the only ones going through our addiction problems, our love problems. Everyone's having relationship problems. The most toxic thing that could have happened to society, Instagram is the most toxic thing that could have happened to traditional relationships in, in a society, period. Because it's this fake grass is always greener. And like, I've Honestly, dated some of the, I've dated some of the, you know, oh, I've got millions of followers. Dude, these girls are miserable. They're 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 really unhappy because they're they're everything about them is like I gotta check my phone. I gotta see like do people still like me? Yeah, if you let it suck you in like that, which I feel like at some point it does, even if you don't want it to. You know, even if you are rational. Yeah. Because, I mean, part of it, too, is, like, if you're putting something out there, you're like, well, I'm putting this out with the intention that somebody is going to not necessarily like it, but like it, yeah, enjoy yeah. it, get something out of it. So you but want that, it to the be... dopamine yes. hits from social media. Oh. The, so the social media has been designed by some of the most sophisticated casino mm-hmm. um, game designers. So they literally format, you know, the metaverse, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I, I had a buddy who his dad made, he built casinos in Vegas, right? And so we got sober together. And so let's talk 10 years ago. I remember going into the casino and people was, you know, in Old Town in Vegas and people were smoking cigarettes, just it's so sad. pumping their coins in. And I'm like, oh, this is the Lost Souls room, like in Beetlejuice, you know? And they're like, mm-hmm. they don't know they're dead. But now... We're all, we're all doing it because yeah. we're all like, and I do it too. Yeah. And we're like, like I turn my phone off to go on the park. I'm like off. I turn my phone off when I go to dinner. I turn my phone off when I go on a date. I yeah. have to turn it off. Oh, it's. I don't want it to have that power over me, mm-hmm. you know, and it's very subversive uh, in the way that we get addicted to it. And so I yeah, don't want the reward prediction error, which is basically what they're basing all this off of mm-hmm. is so powerful. Um, and that way, like, okay, hey, this one post got a lot of interaction, and then the next few didn't. So you're like, well, and then there's a higher dopamine response when there's when it's an incoherent pattern. Sure. So basically, if it's like, if it's okay, every third post you get a lot, then you're going to know that's the pattern. But if it's highly unpredictable, that's what keeps people sucked in. But yeah, and that's how they they're, do, they're they're creating design the it. engagement that way. And the thing is it's that so gross. Instagram a couple years ago, Instagram was cool. You're like, it's just me. It's just my friends doing stuff. Here's my, here's my Uncrustable and my, uh, here's my melted protein bar and my glove box. Yeah, yeah. Or people would post their food. Oh, yeah. Or their, like, person. 
Now it's like people are like, oh, I don't know. Like, we've been together for six years. I don't know if I should post you on my page. Like, Dude, honestly, you're like, what? <laughs> I think that the... It's so weird. It's such an interesting dynamic, like, relationships on social media, right? And um, I often find that the people who are putting it out there so heavily, like, this, like, perfect life, I'm like, yeah, I feel yeah. like y'all are having the worst problems because... I went through that. People Yeah, no, who, I, I went through that. Like, I, I had a... My friend and I, we were friends for years, and we had both gone through breakups at the same time, and I think we kind of rebounded with each other, and, you know, we fell in love, and we weren't supposed to date, and then we did, and then it was everywhere, because we both had big followings, Mm -hmm. I'm a rock star guy, she's like, I'm a fitness model, blah, 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 like, and, you know, she's one of those people who, um, her whole platform was predicated on telling other people how to live their best life and this, that, the other, and, you know, health and fitness and this. And she was the probably one of the most damaged individuals I ever dated. You know, it was like we would have episodes of, like, and she didn't drink all the time, but every time it was violence. Mm-hmm. There was, like, and I, you know, I found the pills, I found this, and there was, like, the it was just the cheating and the lying and the manipulating. And then, you know, I, we broke up. And then I, I'm the kind of person where, like, once the last strike happens, I'm gone. Like, I'm out. And I just packed all my shit. I was paying for our apartment, and I had my own place. And I was like, I just moved back home. And I was like, cool, you're on your own. And, uh, you know... Then I st- a month or two later, I started dating somebody else, and then I got a phone call that uh, from a, a detective and was like, "Oh, uh, we're investigating a domestic violence report." I'm like, "Of who?" Like, I, I'm like, "Was I a witness to something?" And they're like, uh, "Of you." So like, this girl like could not handle that she lost her. You know, like I was paying for everything too, and I was running her businesses. I made her a lot of money, um, and then she she like lost it. So she tried to me to me, and then I beat it in court, in criminal court, and then she sued, she, uh, she didn't sue me, she got a restraining order against me, and then tried to get me to give her $100,000 to drop the restraining order. So I said, I'm like, no, this is illegal. So I went to court then again, and um, yeah, and the judge was like, there's no evidence of domestic violence, so like, we'll give you, you know, you can get an RO for anything. Like, if, if you yell at me, I can go get a restraining order. Right? Mm. I'd be like, oh, I'm scared for my life. So they gave her an online bullying restraining order, so I didn't spill the tea on her because I had evidence that she was a, she was prostituting. That's why we broke up. Mm. And so this is what I'm saying. Like, this person See, is making $150,000 a year teaching women how to live their best life. She's a complete, total fraud, right? And, like, that's just one example of many. There's so many of these gurus. There's all, like... And, and I, I'm in the, I'm friends with a lot of the people in the entrepreneurial entrepreneurial business space, bro. If you, a lot of these people are just snake oil salesmen, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, I fuck with the real guys, but everyone knows like there are people out here like yeah you got to do this and blah blah, and their whole platform is predicated on I'm gonna get like I'm gonna teach you how to make money. You don't even have money. The only money you have is from scamming the people you're pretending to teach how to be successful. That's your your Ponzi scheme. It's like a Jacob's Ladder. It's like click, 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 click. It starts off with nothing, and you just... That's it's the so scam. Gross. It's so gross. Yeah, um, so this that, has been going on, I mean, for for a long time, but it's, it's gotten so, so much worse. It's so oversaturated. It's like... But that also, too, like, people will... I just heard about this story the other day. I don't even really know these people, but someone was telling me, like, this couple um, was was like basically selling the dream of like their relationship and they were doing like relationship workshops and all this stuff. Mind you, they literally like were in the middle of like getting a divorce and you're like, okay, so you're going to paint this like perfect picture to then like get these sales for like these events. And listen, like I'm not saying that because you teach other people about relationships that you can't have your own relationship struggles. Obviously you can't. Listen, this is the thing. (laughs) My friends went through a divorce like this. And they're not, they're fitness trainers. They have nothing to do with whatever. And they don't, they're not online celebrity people. And they had the most amazing divorce ever. And I was like, listen, if you're going to get a divorce, show everyone how to do it. Like if you're a fitness, if you're uh, if you're a guru couple of love and be real because you have to set realistic expectations for your audience that sometimes it's not going to work out. And there's a dignified, honorable way to separate amicably and that is the kind of that's um people will buy that more. That's a more powerful 
example to set. Like the I, I come from the generation of when you said bye to your friends, people would be like, "Yo, keep it real." Like, keep it real. That's how you would say goodbye. Like, I come from a culture where you're not allowed to be fake. It's desp- despicable to be exposed for being fake. And that's why I've, ex- I've exposed a lot of people in Hollywood. I've exposed a lot of people in the music industry. Um, because they're doing, they're stealing, they're doing illegal shit. They're, you know, there's a lot of fucking fucked up shit going on. And people, the and if online you fuck culture with me, is just like. Well, yeah, it's like, it's like don't, don't try to ruin my life with a lie if I can ruin yours with the truth. You know what I mean? And so it, it's just nobody wants to work anymore. You know? Like, I don't... I, I'm like, we don't need any more influences. We need leaders. You know what I mean? Like, everyone's like, I just want to fucking do this and, just, you know, blah, blah. It is crazy when you, like, stop and think about it. Yeah. Like, where are things going? And then... I want to do OnlyFans? Shit. I don't. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know, but Fuck I don't... Like, I'm like, you know what? I mean, it would obviously... De- it would delegitimize my it, artwork because they're going to be like, what the fuck? Certainly has crossed my mind, but, like... What, it's, it's one of those things too that like I think a lot of people look at that and they're like oh well I'd like to do that because it's easy and I'm like it's very easy but, but it's it co- not that easy but it costs something well it costs yeah like you have to want to do that and if you want to do that that's totally fine but like yeah, in order yeah. to be successful it's kind of like everything now like you can't yeah. just like put up a mediocre photo and do this like it is like work yeah like it is I it, guess it is I don't. Like, I don't have to do it. So I make artwork. Yeah, yeah, no. And then I put it out, and people like it, and yeah. I'm like, oh, sick. But like, I you know think a I mean? lot of people are like, oh, just start an OnlyFans, you'll make twenty k a month. It's like, no, that's not an accident. Yeah, but it's not. Maybe yeah, of it course, is. it's not an mm-hmm. accident. But it's also like, it's you know, do you want to sexually objectify yourself, right? And and I maybe I'm mentally ill, <laughs> but. <laughs> I've dated sex workers. I've de- like I've been through this right in my addiction and in recovery, and like I'm like you know, I'm at the point where, you know, I'm in a place of the rejection of modernity, right? So now my value systems are starting to, as I'm maturing, I'm starting to understand the value of old school, right? Like, you know, I it's like I want like going on a date with someone who has no social media is sick. Like you're like you're you're not on social media. Like, what do you mean yeah. not? On, you mean like they, like, don't, they don't have to check their phone. Oh, they don't okay, have to yeah. check in and take a picture of this. That, the, like, you know, and it's cool, and and that's one one aspect. But it's also too like, you know, I'm at I'm at the age where like I'm not looking at a relationship. You know, I took a long time off from my last relationship because it was so toxic, and I've had other toxic relationships. So I've had to go in therapy and really identify what it is about me that is attracted to this personality type. And now I, I my, you know, because I've identified um, the things that I value in a partner now, because I didn't know what they were, because I didn't think, know what I deserved, right? Um, I don't want a pinup model. I want a partner. I don't want a project. I want a partner. I want somebody who's like, sees me working hard and is like has ideas about how we can make more money together mm-hmm. because when I'm in a relationship I make my partners wealthy like because I love them and the way that I love people is to give them independence I'm not a jealous person like I can't do the who's this girl who's that picture you liked blah, blah, blah. I'm like dude this is not reality you know what I mean I was like Who's paying for all these bills like who's showing you how to quadruple your monthly income oh, me you know what I mean? Like, so I don't want, like, it's just about prioritizing things and understanding reality versus fiction. And I'm somebody who, like, obviously, I risked my entire career to be publicly outspoken about my beliefs, whether they were spiritual, whether they were primary political, whether I questioned narratives, you know, you know, I, and I went through it. You know what I mean? I went through a multi million dollar lawsuit. Uh, I was betrayed by lifelong friends over money. And power, which now there's none of because, you know, some people have juice, but once you, you know, the thing is, when you lose the sauce, it's over, you know? And so, you know, often duplicated but never replicated, you know what I mean? Tommy Vexed. And that's the thing. It's scary to have integrity, right? Being an influencer just means I'm going to take this stuff that somebody else made and be like, here, being a leader. It's like being the captain of the Titanic. 
if the fucking ship's going down, you ride it to the bottom, you know? And that's what I did. And then, so, you know, this is one of those, it was one of those things, like, you know, everybody has to get, everybody gets in a lifeboat first, and then, I'll, and then if I, you know, because I'm responsible for everything. I put myself in that mode of responsibility, and I take the hits, and I come, I just refuse to stop fighting. You know what I mean? And so now, because I fought the fight that nobody, no one else in my industry is willing to do, I'm completely independent. I don't need anything from anyone. I'm making more money than bands that are artists that are 10 or 20 times my size because I'm not getting ripped off. And, you know, these are the things, the sacrifices. Sometimes we don't understand what, you know, what the universe or what God, whatever you believe in, why it's giving you trials, right? You know, I've, I've been in the witness protection program, right? My twin brother is doing 20 years in jail for trying to murder me. When I testified against him, he put a hit out on me. Like... I've been through the craziest shit. And in those moments, I wanted to drink and I wanted to use it. This happened in my sobriety, but I couldn't do it. I didn't know why I was going through these things. You know, I was so miserable. You know, I felt like I was made out of glass that if I was walking down the street, if I tripped, I'd fall and shatter into a million pieces because I, it was so hopeless and so bleak. But sometimes life has to bring you to those moments because... That's how you build courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's a judgment that something else is more important. What helped you through those moments of like that exact situation, like walking around feeling like you were going to just fall apart? Helping other people, right? You know, I've talked about this on Andy's podcast. Like my suicide attempt was interrupted because some kid had overdosed on heroin and called me before I jumped in front of a train in New York City and asked me to help him get sober. And I was so low, and I had just put my brother away to jail, and I felt horrible with twins. Not only how could he have done all this to me, but how could I do this? And, like, it goes against all my, like, the code of the street. And I just, everything in my life had been so bad up until that point. I was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. And, uh, yeah, this kid called me, and I wrote a song about it. Actually, it's on my new record. It's called Strong for Someone Else. And... You know, sometimes we don't have the self-esteem to take care of ourselves. We lose, you know, uh, we we just, you know, lose the will to keep fighting. And every time I get into a place where I feel beaten down, I now I try to find somebody to help. Because that's really what we're made here to do, right? You know, this... This kid called me, like, the train that was supposed to kill me took me to meet him, and I sponsored him, and now we're still, he's still one of my best friends. It's been 10 years. His life is amazing. He moved from New York to Miami. You know, he became rich off the stock market. He's a super brilliant guy. But he would have died. If I, if I didn't take that call, he probably would have just got high again the next day and died, and, and I would be died. dead, and then there would be nothing. You know what I mean? And it's nobody so would have been there to tell our story. And so it's not my story. And not even just a story, but the impact that you, you've had and he's had on other people's lives and, like, the impact that the per, like that ripple effect is yeah, yeah. completely unimaginable. I think so. I hope it so. It is. No, yeah. I mean, it is, because even if you impacted one person, sure. that person's going to impact one more and then one more and then one more, and those are all positive interactions. And, honestly, that story literally just, like, gives me chills, the fact that, like he's doing so well and you're doing so well and to think that that all could have been taken away and I think that that is a perfect place to end because thinking about okay everybody can find themselves in these really low moments and that's going to look different for everybody right we might Mm -hmm. find different vices or it might be like whatever it might be and if you're in that spot like getting out of that by not just reflecting on your own self but being able to help someone else really is probably the best way out of it and i think that that's one of the most powerful things that like we just talked about here and i think that if like just taking that lesson Mm -hmm. is is so incredible so if you are in that place or you know someone in that place helping someone else is always going to it's only going to elevate you and everybody else in your life so there really is no downside and that's helping someone else the 12 steps the 12 the last step is in all the programs is taking what you've learned and giving it away freely. Yeah. You know, and that's what anybody can do that. 
you in, know. in a bunch of different ways, you sure. know, whether that's an in-person conversation, whether that's a podcast, whether that's just being fucking nice to someone. You know, I was at the airport this morning, I flew here, and it's so interesting. Like, the airport is just, like, the wildest place ever, right? Like, there's just... Well, I don't, especially I don't really now. Know. I don't the, really know. The airport's of, weird now. The airport, no, but there's it's always... Weird, like people who are freaked out. Like, and, but, like, I, not this flight, but the last flight I was on, I got there at, like, 5 a.m., People are drinking. Like, like there, it's just like a lawless place. Like, people are sleeping on the floor. But, like, it's just always, like, if you really, like, if, like, an alien came down, they're like, where are we? Like, it would just be the weirdest situation. Mm-hmm. But on top of that, there's, the airport's a very stressful place, right? People are late. People are running behind. There's, like, a lot of the crowds, whatever. I feel like it just, it can bring out the worst in people. Sure. And I was watching this lady in front of me today, and I was just, like, I was so struck by her her negative presence, right? And she was she was super loud about how, you know, she was late and this and that. Like, everything was a complaint. And I was like, I was watching her and she was making everybody around her miserable, right? And I watched that and I was like, oh my gosh, I have been that person at some point. So I was like, okay, give this person grace. Like, mm-hmm. I have been there. Don't You don't need to get irritated by this, right? I felt bad for everybody else. And I was just like, wow, this is such a great reminder to... Yeah, maybe you are late. Maybe you are behind. Maybe there's all this shit that's popping off and going wrong. But that is not going to help, right? Like you complaining out loud, you doing this is is not helping. And I don't know why I got on this tangent, but I was just like observing all of this. And I was like, man, like this was a really good reminder to. Yeah, sometimes the best reaction is no action. Yeah. Right? Just like. Okay. Yeah. Like, all right. Like, but it was right, just boys, like, I may know, be hungry, but you get to live today. <laughs> One more day. <laughs> Another day. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate yeah. it. Where can people find you if you don't get uh, banned again from Instagram? <laughs> oh, my! well, my Instagram gets deleted like every time I get 200,000 followers. Uh, my Instagram is at the lone wolf gang, uh, but I'm mostly on TikTok now oh. where, where Tommy is vexed on TikTok. Okay. Tommy we are vexed. at T vexed on Twitter. Okay. Um, my website is probably the best way. Website, probably the best place. Yeah, I have about a hundred thousand people subscribed to my site, nice. so that works too. And I'm on YouTube. I got twelve new songs out. Okay. Um, some what covers. Is the website? What is the website? The website's TommyVexedOfficial.com. Okay. The YouTube is Tommy Vex Lone Wolf. Okay. YouTube slash blah 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 blah. Right. And we're coming on tour. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where I think we're playing Tampa. Are you? I think so. Yeah, we have four shows in Florida. So the Grand okay. Th- the Grand Theft Audio okay. Tour kicks off August 18th in Ramona, California, and the album releases August 19th. I love how the voice just changed. Yeah, Please I've do. never done this. I haven't done the radio voice 350 thousand times before. Get your tickets at TommyBexOfficial dot com. The tour is featuring Peyton Parrish. I don't know if you've ever heard the was, Viking guy. No, I haven't. I was oh, really yeah. hoping you would say this in the Jordan Peterson voice, but oh, yeah, go do it. <laughs> Oh, listen, Bucko, what are you waiting for? The tickets are on sale now. It's essential. It's necessary. You got to go. We're playing all over the country. I went. I, I don't right. know what that was. I think I went Scottish. This, is our, this is our cue. Right. We need to go eat. Bye. <laughs>